Have you ever wished you could be famous? Be honest. Everybody under 30 is like, yes. That is my, I'm going to be an influencer. I'm going to be... The closest I ever got to fame, I didn't get very close. The closest I ever got was I made a national newspaper. Okay, here's the story. I was working, when I was a children's pastor, I was working on the Flagstaff Fire Department Fuel Management Crew. So we were doing thinning operations around the city where the forest interfaces with the city to keep it from burning down in a catastrophic wildfire. And they told us there's going to be some journalists out taking pictures. So look your best, wear your stuff right. So we were working above Thorpe Park up on the hillside below the observatory. And the cameraman came around. And I'm like, okay, I gotta make this look dramatic. I need some, I need a shower of of sawdust. So I actually wasn't doing what I should have been doing. I was making sawdust. And it was this great picture. And I was just, okay, thought nothing of it, heard nothing. About a month later, Kelly is in North Africa on a missions trip with students from NAU. They've been, they've been gone for like uh, two weeks, and they're like, what's going on in America? So they buy a copy of USA Today. And guess who's on like page 19? It's that picture of me blowing sawdust in Flagstaff. And they had my name in it. And it was like, wow, I'm famous. That's as close as I got. You know, Jim Carrey, he said, I think everyone, everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. So a follow-up question then is, do you have to be significant to be used by God? No. Well, I don't even need to preach that. All right. <laughs> Let's pray. No, do you, do you have to be famous? Do you need to be a great evangelist like Billy Graham or Billy Sunday? Or a great healer like Oral Roberts? Or a pastor of great faith like, like Bill Johnson of Bethel? Or maybe a famous pastor like Stephen Furtick or John MacArthur? Or do you have to found a denomination like Chuck Smith and Greg Glory? Is that what God needs? to make an impact in this world. I wonder if we have mistaken prominence for significance. So this summer, the remainder of this summer, we're gonna take a little stroll through everybody's favorite minor prophet, Habakkuk, right? It's your favorite, you've read it, you love it. Maybe you will when the summer's over. It's gonna be a fairly short series. It's a fairly short book. Some of you are like, that's in the Bible? <laughs> yes, it is. And if you're not sure where, the Bible has this table of contents. And there is no shame in using it. I'm serious. If you don't know where to find it, look it up. You don't have to pretend you're like, oh, it's somewhere. <laughs> Just look up the page number. You can turn right there. In my Bible, it's page 904. That should be really helpful. So... This book called Habakkuk, it's named after the prophet who wrote it. And we know virtually nothing about this man. All we have that's credible is this writing. Scholars don't know anything about his background, his history. How did he come to this place of being a prophet? Nobody knows for sure. There are some apocryphal kind of fantastic accounts that are not really credible that say, one says he's the, the son of the Shunammite woman who Elijah raised from the dead, Elisha. That's a room, that's a, that's one thought. And there's this apocryphal tale called Bell and the Dragon, <laughs> sounds interesting. And Habakkuk appears in this, in that apocryphal tale because God tells him to make this stew and then an angel transports him with the stew to Daniel, who's been thrown in the lion's den again. So neither one of those sounds really very true, does it? The time frame that he wrote is somewhere around the time of Jeremiah, the prophet. So around 605 to 612 B.C. or B.C.E. here in school. 
And it's a time frame when King Josiah had made these dramatic reforms. And if you've read the story of King Josiah, you see there was like this glimmer of hope for Israel because he was turning the nation around. But then he went and involved himself in a war when he was about 30 and got himself killed. And the reforms plummeted <coughs> and the nation went down the toilet. And the Babylonians were on their way under King Nebuchadnezzar. So let's read what Habakkuk wrote, and then we're going to break down a few things this morning. <clears throat> Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Wow. This is kind of unlike any other prophet. Mm -hmm. Starts out radically differently. But the first thing I want to point out is that you don't have to be well known to be used by God. And this is not textual so much as it is contextual. We know nothing about this man. Clearly, he wasn't famous enough to hit history in any other place except right here. And yet, God used him to pen one of the one of the sixty-six books of the Library of Scripture we call the Bible. Theologians Barker and Bailey describe the prophet like this. Habakkuk was a person of great faith and great courage who dared to take the theological teaching of his day and <laughs> test it against the experience of his own personal life and of the nation. Habakkuk opened the role of the, adopted the role of the philosopher of religion, seeking to understand the troubling times in light of his theological heritage. Whereas his colleagues served primarily as messengers from God to the people, Habakkuk took the concerns that troubled him and his fellow citizens to God. Such action shows that he was an honest doubter, contemplative and speculative by nature, with moral and ethical sensitivity, who searched for truth, maintained profound reverence for God with a deep personal faith. Any honest doubters in the room? We'll talk about that in a minute. His name in the Hebrew means to embrace or like to struggle. And it's possible he is named that because that's what he's doing with God here in his writing. He's, he's struggling with God. He's wrestling with God. But it is also possible that truly is his name and he's simply living up to the name his parents gave him. My daughter and son-in-law named their son Emiliano, my grandson. And that name means rival or industrious. <laughs> Man, I don't know, name your kid rival? <laughs> you know what they got? They got an industrious little rival. <laughs> Man, he is living up to every bit of his name. Now, did, is he living up to it because they named him that? Or did they name him that prophetically because that's who God named him to be? Either way, this little boy is going to do great things for God's kingdom. So Habakkuk is unique because it's the only prophetic book where God is questioned. So there's this unknown guy who declares himself to be a prophet. He wrote this, the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. So he's declaring himself a prophet. And it's possible he was a Levite but also was functioning as a prophet. And the role of the prophet in the New Testament was twofold. First of all, they would often rebuke the conduct of kings and nations. And secondly, they would also predict future events. And Habakkuk is actually going to do both of those things. So this unknown guy takes up this mantle, declares himself a prophet, and he speaks boldly to God and to Israel. So if God can use a man like this, what could he do with you? What could he do with me? Let's look at Jesus for a moment as our example. You know, he was a bit of an unknown when he entered the scene. He spent most of his life in obscurity, in the carpenter shop. 
He was not famous. He didn't have a furniture store named after him. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth furniture. I don't know. There's no archaeological record of it. So he goes from this, this place of obscurity to declaring himself to be a rabbi and gathering a following. And it annoyed people, especially in his hometown. Matthew 13, 55 to 57. Jesus had returned to his hometown. And the, the people said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. So he rises from obscurity and people rail against him. So he knows what it is to spend time as an unknown. And he ends up being the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So God is not limited by your popularity. Is that good news? How many of you were popular in high school? One person admits it. I know there's more than that. It was not me. I wanted to be popular. Didn't work. But God is not limited by what other people think of us. What's more important is what does God think of you? Are you famous in his eyes? There's a saying, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. He doesn't wait for you to be fully equipped before he says, hey, I need you to step out in ministry. He doesn't wait for you to memorize the entire Old Testament before he says, hey, take my love to your neighbor. He will use you as soon as you're willing, and he will equip you as soon as you respond to his call. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 26-29. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. That's, that's a little bit of a blow there, Paul. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world. <laughs> Paul's saying, hey, this is you guys, man. The foolish things of the world. If God can use you, he can use anyone. <laughs> Foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Man, this is such good news. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. So God specializes in using unknowns. He used Habakkuk, and he, he might use us. And I wonder, is there a message you are uniquely qualified to share with the world? C.S. Lewis has this idea that every believer sees some aspect of God more clearly than any other believer. Amen. Now think about an infinite God. There's plenty of aspects of God. What, what piece of God can you represent to this world better than anyone else? And are you doing it? Here's the thing. You're preaching. You're preaching. You might as well just embrace it. The question is what are you preaching? Are you preaching the gospel of work will get what you need? Are you preaching the gospel of man's sports or where it's at? Are you preaching the gospel of a little more education is all you need? Or are you preaching something about Jesus? Second thing I want to bring out, and maybe more significantly, is that questioning God is okay. Questioning God is okay. In verses 2 through 4, Habakkuk actually seems to be kind of railing on God. He accuses God of not listening, of not saving them. These are, this is the God of the universe, and he says, you're not listening. You're not saving us. He says, you're tolerating injustice and wrongdoing. And he's talking to God here on behalf of Israel. Because he sees iniquity, he sees wickedness, he sees destruction, strife, contention. And he says the law is 
has been paralyzed. Okay, that is bold words for a prophet. <coughs> Normally the prophets were affirming the law, right? You're not following the law, and therefore Israel's about to get this major condemnation, this invasion, whatever. Judgment's coming because you ignored the law. Habakkuk is saying the law seems to be paralyzed and ineffective. This is quite a statement for a prophet. Because the usual pattern for a prophetic book, and if you read through the minor prophets, you'll see they'll, they'll receive a prophetic word from the Lord, and they'll deliver it to the people. That's the normal pattern. But Habakkuk looks around and sees the problems with the world and takes that to God. Now God will respond, and we're going to look at that. But it's an entirely different type of prophetic book. And when I read it, it reminds me of what I read in Job. This accusation against God. Job 21.7. Job complains, why do the wicked live on growing old and increasing in power? Have you ever wondered that? Why is it that the good die young and the wicked just seem to hang on forever? Think about it this way. God is waiting as long as possible to reveal himself to them. It's his mercy that lets them live long. It's not because of the life they've chosen. It's because God has given them every available moment. It doesn't mean every good person dies young and every wicked person lives to be an old person, but it's, you see it sometimes. And we have questions. And so Habakkuk, his complaint is, how can God use this evil nation that's coming, the Babylonians? How can he use them to bring judgment against Israel when they're worse than Israel? So it's, it's healthy to express your questions and your doubts to the God of the universe. He can handle your questions. He can Let's look at Jesus as our example again. Because even Jesus had a moment of questioning God. In that moment on the cross when he was separated from God by the sins of the world, all of humanity for all of eternity, all of our sins were heaped on him in that moment. And what did he cry out to God? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This, this question against God. Let's look at God's response to Habakkuk's first complaint. We're going to read verses 5 through 11 of chapter 1. Here's how God responds to his question. How can you let this wickedness go on? God says to him, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and provoke, promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. By building earth and ramps, they capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people, whose own strength is their God. So God's answer to Habakkuk's complaint is not what you would expect, is it? And I see this often. God doesn't answer the question that we ask. Instead, in this case, God says, look what I'm about to do, Habakkuk. I'm about to do something that's never been done before. I'm going to do something new in history. I'm going to use this wicked nation to punish my rebellious nation, Israel. There's a couple things we can extract from this. The first is that God deals with sin in our lives ruthlessly. So if you're here in this room and you're following Jesus, let me just tell you, this is what God thinks of the sin that we allow into our lives. 
And this is how he will deal with it if we don't address it. It is his mercy that brings revelation into our lives. You know, when a pastor falls, when these, when these guys, it's revealed whatever, there's an affair or there's pornography or there's stealing money, it's God's mercy that motivates him to reveal those things so that their soul can be saved. You know, there's never a moment where you're so close and intimate with God that he will overlook your sin. It doesn't happen. Now, with my grandkids, sometimes we'll be hanging out, having this great time. Like, they're being so sweet and loving. And it's like, I wish this moment could go on forever. And then they do something. <laughs> something happens. And, and I don't want to punish them. Because we've been having such an intimate moment. God doesn't feel that way. God's like, no, bro. I gotta throw hands now. Assume. God doesn't tolerate it. He has better plans for you than you have for yourself. And his plans never include walking in sin and wickedness and immorality. There's never an excuse, and God never excuses it. Now, the good news is he is patient. Aren't you glad he's patient? Yes. Like, what if every time you did something, God made it public? <laughs> but he's patient. And he waits for us to come to him in repentance. So this is what we see here, is God is about to aggressively deal with Israel's sin. I want to set up my life in a way that God doesn't have to aggressively deal with my sin. I want to set myself up so I don't have to live through this. Habakkuk, his problem is not that God's going to bring judgment. He's not saying Israel and Judah are innocent. His problem is, how can God use someone worse than them to bring judgment for their <coughs> sin? He felt like it compromised the character of God. But here's the second thing that I can pull out of this passage. He trusted God's character enough to wrestle with him. He trusted God's character enough to wrestle through this with God. If he didn't trust God's character, he wouldn't even have bothered complaining. If you don't trust somebody's character... You don't go to them to try to make things right. You go to them if you think there's a chance that they'll listen and you can be reconciled. And we're going to experience many things in life where we're going to say, God, what's going on? People die all the time. Way too early. I mean, it always feels too early in one sense. Because... We know deep in our hearts that we are eternal beings. That's why humans long for all these solutions for aging. The, the fountain of youth, they're always in search of it. That's why we're doing low carb, no carb, keto, paleo. We're going to exercise. We're going to do high impact. We're going to do running, whatever. We're trying to live longer, and it's not a bad thing. I think as a good steward, I need to live as long as God has for me to live. But when someone dies, we realize, we recognize that this eternal being has been snuffed out, at least the physical part of us. And it feels like an abomination, even when it's at the right time. So how much more out of place does it feel when someone who is young dies? Or when, when children suffer? It just feels like, God, could you just bring your wrath on those people? And God's like, well, but then what would I have to do to you? Here's the thing. Habakkuk understood this. It's okay to bring those questions to God. And it sounds kind of harsh, the way he talks to God. But here's the thing. Doesn't God already know your complaint? Doesn't he already know what you're thinking? So by you expressing it, you're not in any more jeopardy than you were before. Because it was already in here, right? 
You're already like, God, why do the wicked rage and the innocent die? And but you're just thinking it, you're not saying it. God knew. You're not suddenly in trouble because you spoke it. Actually, when you speak it, you've got a chance to, to have a dialogue with you. So I think it's important that we express our doubts to God. It doesn't mean you don't have faith. And you know, God doesn't expect you to exercise blind faith. That's not, that's not faith, that's insanity. This thing of following Jesus, yes, it's by faith, but it's not blind faith at all. It's faith based on the credibility of this word. It's faith based on 2,000 years worth of human testimony. It's faith based on strong evidence that there really is a God. And that he sent his son, Jesus, who really did walk in human history. And he died on a cross and something incredible happened because he rose from the dead. And hundreds of them went to their deaths believing Jesus had risen from the dead. This book that we follow is the most historically verified book there is. It's the only ancient writing with the, the level of manuscript evidence. Nothing compares to it. Your faith is not blind. Your faith is well-reasoned. That's not my But Habakkuk knew the character of God, and he knew it was safe to express his questions. Besides, he's speaking for the whole community. He's speaking for all of Israel. And so they needed answers. They wanted answers. Let's continue reading. Habakkuk 1, 12 and 13. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Here's the thing, my last point is this, God's character never changes. The back of the character, God is calling. <laughs> God's calling. I need to answer. God's character does not change. And this is why Habakkuk is willing to go approach him. If you grew up in an abusive household, you knew that you had to carefully read the room. Every time the abuser came in, you had to read, microanalyze everything going on because you did not want to trigger them. Because their character would be up and down depending on alcohol content or drugs or circumstances. And so your goal was to survive that encounter without triggering them. So you would read their micro expressions. God is not like that. God's character is the same. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchanging. And that's why Habakkuk could, could approach him, even in the face of all this stuff that didn't look like it made any sense. He could approach God because he trusted God's character. And God's character doesn't change. How many of you would say your character has developed since you were a child? Or you are not the person you were even in high school? Right. Anybody? Nobody? One person. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, our character changes. We mature. We hopefully grow to be Christ-like. That's our goal. God never had that awkward junior high phase. He is God. He's the same. And so my question is, do I trust God's character enough to wrestle with him. Because here's who, here's who Habakkuk says he is. Let's just break down this, these verses really quick. He calls him the Lord. That is the existing one. Self-existent. Who else can say that? Who else can say, I am self-existent? Anybody here without parents? You were not born. <laughs> Nobody? Yeah. You, your life is dependent on whoever gave birth to you. And their life came from wherever gave birth to them, and so on and so on. Back to the beginning, and do you know what happened in the beginning? 
Life begat life. Life does not come from non-life. It's impossible. It's illogical, irrational, and impossible. So any theory you have for the creation of the world that doesn't involve God creating life, there's nowhere else for life to come from. Life begets life, and He is the Lord, the self-existent One. And then He says, you are from everlasting, from the beginning. In a sense, it means from the East. Because what happens in the East every morning? The sun rises, so in a sense, life starts in the East and rises to the West. I don't know which direction. I got it right. Anyway. Camp Verde always messes me up. It's probably this. I always think, this should be North, and it's never North. It's always that way. So I'm going to put a compass in the floor of my house. No. He says, you are from everlasting. God is unchanged, he's unchanging, and he's unchangeable. Malachi 3.6, he's another of these, these shorter prophetic words. In, in his writing in chapter 3, verse 6, he said, I, the Lord, change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The reason we can hope is because God has not changed. He's not going to suddenly change his mind. Be like, you know, I liked Roland initially, but I'm over it. He's on his own. He's not going to do that. He's not going to be like, yeah, Jason, he's kind of annoying me. I think I'm done. I think I'm over it. <laughs> Moving on. That's not God. That's not his character. He's so patient with us. And then he, he says, my God, and that word is Elohim. It's a plural word with a singular meaning. That's interesting. We serve a plural God with a singular meaning. Me. He's God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he says, my Elohim. Meaning, he has a relationship with this God. So not only is he God, but he can be your God, your personal God. You can have a relationship with him. And then he calls him my Holy One. That word is kwadosh, and it means set apart, sacred. That's who God is which is good news and bad news. It's amazing that God is holy. What's the bad news? I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, exactly. There's a problem there. Fortunately, he's going to make a way. And then he says, never dying. Now, some translations say, we will never die. Some say, you will never die. The Masoretic text says, you will never die. Or we will never die. Sorry. Either way, it's good news. Okay, if we will never die, then we can depend on God for eternity. If he will never die, the same traffic, we can depend on God forever. And then he calls him, he says, you my rock. And it's like a rocky wall, a cliff, a, a huge rocky crag. What does that bring to mind? Maybe a fortress. Maybe a castle on a hill. Maybe like the old mob house in Rimrock. <laughs> Anybody know about that? There's a stone house that sits on a hilltop and is rumored to have been in the 20s and 30s a mob house where all their wounded gangsters would go to be treated by doctors and heal up away from the prying eyes of the feds. <laughs> Sounds like Aunt Bertie today. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> God doesn't change, can we? He doesn't change. <laughs> but then he says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. And you can't look on wickedness with favor. There again, that's really amazing and it's kind of terrifying because what happens, what do we do? Even in our best attempts, we fall short, right? Do you still have moments where you give in to stuff? You say things you shouldn't have said? You do things you shouldn't have done? You think things you shouldn't have thought? Or have you reached sinless perfection? <laughs> I still need a Savior. His name is Jesus. And that's the good news. That's how God can continue to look on us. That's why this isn't just bad news and condemnation. This is hope. 
Because Jesus, again, is our example. In spite of our brokenness and our sin, God can look upon us when he looks on us through Jesus. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Jesus did it. And when God looks through his blood, his sacrifice, I can stand in his presence. I can stand in front of his throne and make petitions. I can even stand in front of his throne and say, just like Job did, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous are suffer? And God doesn't just smite me, because he's looking at me through the eyes, the lens of Jesus. <laughs> Romans 9, 8 says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? God does not change. There was evil then, and there's evil now. What brought Israel to judgment is the same thing that's bringing us to judgment. It's ignoring his word. It's living in violation of his word. But the good news is the same God who saved them. And if you read, you'll see he saved a remnant. He preserved a remnant all through history. That's the same God that will preserve us. That's the same God that's waiting for you. And so just like Habakkuk said, we will not die. You don't have to die. I have a couple points for you to ponder if you want to this week. First is, if God can use someone like Habakkuk, someone who's an unknown, in what ways might he be able to use you and I? Like in your wildest imagination, what could God do? Do you picture yourself like Billy Graham or like Mother Teresa out on the streets in Calcutta? In your wildest imagination, what could you see God doing in you and through you? Because I want to tell you, he could do it. And if you say, man, I want to be a preacher, come talk to me. I got some books you can read. Number two, God can handle our questions. And this may sound like blasphemy for you. It's okay. It's not. God can handle your questions. He's not put off by your question. In fact, all you're doing is actually finally being honest with him. Because if the questions are in here, God already knows them. You might as well speak them out to him and start the dialogue. Just remember his character as you question him. And come to him in a little bit of fear and trepidation. I mean, I imagine Habakkuk, yes... He was complaining to God, but he also understood who God was. So, what complaints, what doubts do you have in here that you haven't been expressing to God? Maybe consider bringing the conversation to your father. I'm going to pray in just a moment. But you know, if you're here without Jesus then you're actually in the same place that Israel was. You're, you're in line for, for God's wrath. But you don't have to stay there. God can look on us with favor because of Jesus, because he stands between God and us. Like 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 says, there is one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for me. How, how ridiculous is that? A nobody like me. Yet Jesus said, I got you. I'm going to pay the price because you can't. <coughs> so this morning, I just want to give you this opportunity never asked Jesus to save you, if you've never made that decision to follow him, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. And when I pray, I'll just ask you, if that's you, raise your hand, I want to pray with you. I won't embarrass you, I won't make you come to the front. I just want to pray with you where you're sitting. Maybe you've run from God, maybe you knew him and you, you've run as far as you could away. 
tell you what, he's ready. He's ready for you to come back. He's been there the whole time waiting. His arms are open. You just have to call out to him. So let's pray. Let's close this up. So we can have ice cream. You realize this is National Ice Cream Sunday. <laughs> That's pretty fun. Anyway. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. And I thank you that you can use anybody who's willing, anybody who will step up here, you can use them for your purposes. You don't have to be super gifted, talented, famous, popular. All we have to be is available for you. Jesus, that's so hopeful and amazing. So God, my prayer is that we as a church would be available for you. Each of us here who's following you would make ourselves available. That we would take this good news to our neighbors, to this community. And God, you know we have questions. I know there are questions in this room, and they're important questions. There's questions of injustice, of timing. God, there are things that are so close to our hearts. Father, I pray that we can bring those questions into the light so that you can dialogue with us. And I know you may not answer those questions, but you will give us a perspective, God, to walk through those questions with. God, would you just continue to re reveal yourself to us as this eternally good God? And if you're here this morning and are in that place in your spiritual journey <clears throat> where you're ready to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. If that's you this morning, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. I want to pray with you where you sit. Anybody this morning? Okay, I see that hand. Just pray with me. Jesus, I surrender. I have sinned. And I've been a rebel. I've done things the way I want to do them. And I repent. I need a Savior, and I know it's you, Jesus. So would you save me?